Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution, digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct-by-construction, concurrent, scalable solution our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative planet. Please join us on this journey. Okay, welcome to this week's Climate and Coordination Rcast. There's a lot to discuss today. Some of it happy, some of it not so happy. Um, actually, I don't have any happy stories today. Um, so it's, it's all going to be just reality, but hopefully we'll sprinkle in some sort of inspiration. Um, this is a very fascinating piece by The Guardian. I love The Guardian. This was just posted on November 18th. And The Guardian, I've said so many times, does amazing climate journalism and it's almost never behind a paywall and it's just really good. And this is a fascinating story. I've never seen this laid out like this before. Um, it says the forgotten oil ads that told us climate change was nothing. I just found this um, yesterday and it's got some amazing graphics and it's just fascinating. So I just wanted to read a bit about this, about basically the history of oil funded disinformation in, or lies, we could say lies, in, um, in media, especially print media, um, which b- basically began in the 1980s. And it kind of goes through some different phases of the tactics that they used to make the public forget about this issue and sort of see it as a non-starter um, or a nothing burger or whatever term you prefer. And obviously to some extent this has worked because there's still a large uh, portion of the population, at least in America, uh, certainly not a majority, but, but a big chunk that, that really um, doesn't understand what's going on with this issue. And I think probably, um, you know, after 40 years of this, um, you know, you can see some effect of that, of course, politicians and other people are totally liable as well. But this piece is very interesting because it really details the different um, the different tactics that they went through. Like there were different eras of these lies. And I just wanted to share a few of these. So the first one they talk about is um, it's called the early days learning to spin. This is from Humble Oil, which is now Exxon Mobil. I had no idea they used to be called Humble Oil. Uh, it says they were not self-conscious about the potential environmental impacts of its products in its 1962 advertisement. So now we're talking, uh, you know, almost 60 years ago. Each day, Humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. That's what the ad says, as if that's a good thing. It shows a picture of a glacier and it's showing basically how powerful their product is, how, how full of energy it is. Um, it says three years earlier in 1959, America's oil bosses had been warned that burning fossil fuels could help, uh, sorry, could lead to global heating sufficient to melt the ice cap and submerge New York. This is what they were told in 1959. So now this is over 60 years ago. Um, and then in 1979, there was also uh, a study that an internal Exxon study that warned of quote dramatic environmental effects before 2050. Um, and it also says here by the late 1970s, a former Exxon scientist recently recalled global warming was no longer speculative. So even at this early stage, you know, the climate movement hadn't even gotten started, but yet the science was pretty clear. Um, Next era was the reposition global warming as theory, not fact. There's a clip here that says, who told you the earth was warming? Chicken Little. Uh, And it also says, doomsday is canceled again. 
So this was sort of an idea of getting people to see that, um, you know, people said the world was going to end so many times and it kept not ending and you couldn't really trust the science. So I guess that was kind of the beginning of the 90s. Then came the era of emphasizing the uncertainty. Uh, this is from the 80s to the 2000s. So now we're moving into this millennium. And it says here, um, there was two articles that they showed here, clips from, from that were published by the company Mobile, Exxon Mobile, I guess, um, with the Mobile logo at the bottom. And it says, lies they tell our children. And the other one is apocalypse, no. And these were ads that were taken out in the New York Times. So there were, you know, articles written by oil companies basically saying, don't worry about this. And they're lying. Then also, I did not know this, between 1996 and 1998, Mobile ran 12 advertisements timed with the 1997 UN-Kyoto negotiations that question whether the climate crisis is real and human made, and 10 that downplayed its seriousness. Um, so yeah, the, the title of one of those is Unsettled Science. So basically they're saying, okay, now everybody's talking about this, but let's not panic. And we don't agree anyway, which is a total lie. Um, let's see. Um, then the next era was economic scaremongering. I think we're all kind of familiar with that. Um, basically making the, you know, sort of push for decarbonization, although it wasn't decarbonization at that point, trying to frame it as an economic, um, uh, an enemy of the healthy economy, basically saying that it's too expensive or it risks the economic future or whatever which is also BS. Um, and then also now we're in the final basically two eras. And these I think are kind of still going on from 2004 to 2006, the it's not our fault, it's yours started, which can kind of um, encompass all the talk about people's personal footprints, personal choices, just the using of straws, the plastic bags, all that stuff of course contributes to the issue, but you know, the lion's share of our problem is that there are a few companies that are doing most of this um, and not even doing it responsibly by spilling and not cleaning their mess up and so on and so forth. Um, and so that is a very fascinating era that I think we're still in. Um, and also I think you see on Twitter and other places very often, anybody who's a climate skeptic or anybody who does it want to go along with this you know fight to save the planet will often criticize someone for their personal impact you know like for example i even saw just yesterday the day before leo dicaprio was posting about um oil drilling rights and somebody commented oh hey you know are you still flying on a private jet do your girlfriend still drive gas cars and that you know that's sort of an oil company tactic to shame the person rather than to really get at the industry um, and then finally, the last era here is, well, actually, this is the second to last one, greenwashing, talk clean and act dirty, which I think we're still in, which is basically PR. Um, and then finally, we're part of the solution, which is basically all of the advertisements that the oil companies themselves have been running over the past few years to basically position themselves as the ones to solve the problem, even though they're expanding where they're drilling, there's tons of toxic waste to clean up that they have not cleaned up. They are lobbying against climate action at every turn. Um, but again, they still run these advertisements, especially on YouTube and Twitter, where they sort of um, pretend that they are the ones who can solve it and they've got it all under control. and. So that is, uh, that is very, very tricky. So this is where we are now. And um, I'll pause there for comments. Yeah, yeah, interesting article. Um, it's funny how they create these like kind of front organizations, like back in which era was it? It was the emphasize the uncertainty era. They got into these kind of like forming these kind of like groups, like uh, what was it called here? this group called the Global Climate Coalition. 
And, you know, it sounds like it's this, you know, nonprofit that's there for the people and it's them, you know, and they're, 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 you know, scaremongering about, you know, how you're going to lose jobs. The global climate coalition is really concerned about, you know, losing jobs. Yeah. Like it aren't, so wasn't there, wasn't there, didn't they take Exxon to, uh, court over this isn't there some kind of uh, outstanding battle going on right now where they're trying to basically say exxon is directly responsible because they knew they knew and they directly lied yeah i mean i think there's been a lot of those actions in the past there's also a, a group of kids basically that are trying to throw the constitution at them and say that they're infringing on their right to i think life liberty and the pursuit of happiness by destroying knowingly destroying their environment um, and then, of course, there's Stephen Donziger. I hope I'm saying his name right. Stephen Donziger, who w- went to prison recently for winning a nine billion ish dollar lawsuit against, I think it was Exxon as well, for poisoning water. I think it was in the Amazon. Um, and they're just basically, I don't even know what he's guilty of. They're just retaliating against him for some reason because he I think won the biggest judgment in history so there's a lot of action still going and I hope that people levy more actions because they are responsible so I I mean obviously money changing hands is not going to solve everything but maybe that money can be used to help relocate people or clean up messes or whatever but yeah I think there's a lot of actions. Yeah, I think the one that I'm thinking of was kind of um, semi-recent. It was I just found a headline here. Um, it was it was during a panel in in the in uh, the house, the, like a congressional panel, and uh, there was um, Cong- Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, um, where she likened it to the tobacco industry, and uh, and you know kind of said, well, you know, if the tobacco industry was you know punished for their outright lying then, you know, this is like, that pales in comparison to this. Yeah, it's, it's so sad what's going on. And um, it's really smart. I mean, these companies are incredibly smart at figuring out how to just sway public opinion. I mean, it's taken a long time for them to do it. But I really applaud them on their evil genius of figuring out what are the different angles that we can get to sow doubt amongst something that is so obvious. Um, you know, if, wouldn't it be so amazing to take that amazing PR energy, money, uh, you know, um, expertise, uh, and dedication and put it towards something important and something like, imagine if these were the people behind, you know, um, getting vaccines out to the world or something or ending world hunger. I don't know, whatever. Like the world would be, it's so sad. I feel like there's such a, an obvious concentration of talent in such terrible places. You know, like there is amazing human potential and expertise and passion, but like I just feel a lot of times it's really squandered in these just horrible, um, in these, hor- it's used in these horrible ways, which is sad to me. I know, like how, how it's just like, you know, the, the mindset involved in like knowing it's a lie and completely, you know, creating like, you know, using your expertise at brain manipulation because you've, you know, studied like public relations, which actually that term was uh, a term that was used by Edward Bernays because the word propaganda was getting a bad rap. You know, even the word public relations was a public relations play. <laughs> um, you know, and so these people who are like, you know, studied this for years and they're like geniuses at like changing brains, you know, and then they get hired by these companies and these companies are like, okay, what we got you to do, what you got to do here is, <laughs> you know, you got to lie that we're, you know, destroying the planet, but we're not right. So you got to tell everyone this and uh, you know, how what goes through the mind of a person who who actively does that like i i yeah, literally don't get it yeah. how do they how do they sleep at night like 
I think maybe I like as I, I, I try to wrap my head around it, it's like mm-hmm. there's this caveat emptor kind of idea. It's like, you know, you're the sucker. You know, it's your fault for not, you know, understanding that I'm bullshitting you, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. That I mean, that attitude. is, that is, it's so true. And yeah, I, I think it's so sad as well, because like, if these people are so smart, which clearly they are, they're just using it for an evil purpose. Like they could very easily work somewhere else and make a great living. You know what I mean? Like, why do they have to do this? What, like, did you see what I'm saying? Like, if you're so yeah. great at PR, if you're so great at whatever, why do you have to use it for this horrible purpose? You know, go work for the NFL. Like, do something that isn't, like, actively ruining society, you know? Yeah, it's just, I guess there, there's some kind of a thing that happens in your brain where you, where you isolate the thing you're doing from the skill that you have. Like, you kind of yeah, go, right. like, you know, somehow you just, you, you figure out how to justify it to yourself that it's not you that's doing the harm. It's, it's the, the fool who's believing you. It's like, I don't know. It's a, yeah. Or maybe it runs in people's families for long enough that they actually believe their own crap. Like that's possible potentially, you know? Um, I don't think all of them believe it, you know, because that would be insane. But I think maybe if, you know, three, four generations of your family has worked in a similar industry you know, or maybe even at the same company, there could also be that, you know, you don't want to be the odd one out or something. I don't know. It's, it's devastating. And I think it takes, I agree with you. I think it takes some amazing mental fortitude, but not in a good way to compartmentalize that. And yeah, it's shocking. I mean, it's like psychopathic, honestly, at this point, you know? Yeah, yes, yeah, at least sociopathic. It, it's, yeah, whatever. Some kind of like, pathic, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I'm going to move on now, I think. There's one more story I wanted to share, and then I'm going to pass it to you, Daryl, um, because I know there's some stuff you want to talk about. And um, this story, um is from the seattle times this is basically a recap on now it's about 10 or sorry nine days old now so this might have uh, but uh, it hasn't radically changed in nine days though um this was written before the end of cop just before the end of cop and now cop is over but it says despite net zero pledges world is on track to warm 2.5 degrees celsius uh that's based on a un report so basically this is the result of this this is why i wanted to do this in this order we have as i wrote in a a new blog that is hopefully going to be finished today we have delayed you know if we had started decarbonizing in the 90s or even in 2000 like meaningfully i know people were talking about it but meaningfully we would have been able to go down this cute little bunny hill slope of decarbonization And it wouldn't have been that disruptive. It wouldn't have been that rushed. People would have just like, I don't know. It's so sad because we burned all those decades up. And now the path to save this planet is so steep. Like we have to decarbonize so incredibly quickly. Um, It's just frustrating because right now, you know, people want to keep the 1.5 degree goal alive. I think that we shouldn't give up hope until we actually surpass it. We've already warmed about 1.2 degrees. So we have about 0.3 degrees more of warming until that goal is squandered. But now we're on track to get to 2.5, but even just at two degrees, it's a certainty chemically, like physically, that all the coral reefs will die. So Now we're saying we're on track to surpass even that, to go to 2.5. So we need to really address this. Like I know that in the press with the infrastructure bill that President Biden just passed, which is a great, you know, step forward. There's a lot of, you know, they're going to electrify the government vehicles and, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there that's positive, but it doesn't go nearly far enough because clearly if we're headed toward 2.5, like the reason I mentioned the coral reefs is because I think that 
well, first off, I love the coral reef and it's a very emotional that like that to me is like the epitome of God's creation or of whatever creation of earth, like evolution, whatever. The coral reef to me is like the most stunning display of life on earth and the, the hope of life in the galaxy, in the, in the cosmos, which is earth as far as we know. And to think about the fact that that could be wiped out, it's certain it's going to not survive two degrees, basically. Already it's dying at 1.2. So for sure they say at two, it's going to be gone. How that affects the ocean health and how the ocean health affects us is a set of cascading, you know, circumstances, which we don't want to ever test the limits of, but it looks like we are doing that. But I think like people need to realize that like, instead of just always reporting on, you know, this town might experience a, a risk or an increase of these conditions sometimes. Like it needs to be more stark, I think, because when when the reports about the future of this planet are done in that way, which I think is good because it's measured, it's nuanced, right? It respects the science. It's it's a it's risk, right? You're assessing the level of risk over time, but nobody ever really talks about these like basic like certainties, right? And I think that if people could understand these, you know, basically scientific certainties based on evidence, like it's not like the coral reefs haven't died already. Like they're dying, they're dying everywhere. Like we know this. Um, I think that more people would understand the urgency of the climate crisis and and what it really costs us. You know, it's not just about like, oh, a few more heat waves. Okay, like, you know, we could lose this gem of the universe and if we do that I just think it's going to be sorry there's a bit of construction outside once again um I just think it's going to be devastating spiritually but also you know we don't know if humans can survive without a thriving coral reef you know it's so Anyway, I just wanted to announce right now it says that we're headed for 2.5 degrees of warming. I'm sure that there are reports that maybe say it's a little higher or lower, give or take. But we already know, last point I want to make on this, we already know that um, Earth right now, having warmed 1.2 degrees, give or take, from pre-industrial levels, is already not safe in lots of places. It's already uninhabitable or getting uninhabitable in a lot of places. So the fact that, you know, we're headed for 2.5, which is double that warming. And of course, when you warm double, it's not just that it gets worse by twice, like every fraction of a degree, every 10th of a degree, it becomes many, many times worse. Um, Because it's climate is a non-linear sort of system, I guess. And I'm sure Greg can (laughs) explain that better. But Right now we're headed for 2.5. And so we need to do a bunch of things very quickly to make sure that we, we stay under two. And um, so I'll pause there for comments and then Daryl, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right. Um, so, so one thing that, uh, that you've mentioned in the past um, is about this kind of the net zero idea. Um, you know, this article, the headline was, uh, Despite net zero pledges, world on track to warm 2.5 degrees. So the whole idea of like, uh, you know, climate offsets where, you know, you, you plant a tree and I'll, you know, and I'll burn some more oil. Um, it's, you know, it, it's uh, not the solution, right? It's not, um, you know, at best, it will just stop things where they are, which, you know, there's no way it will. But, you know, so, so it's not really a solution. Um, but one thing I do like about it is it's the beginning of the glimmer of the world waking up to its own consciousness. Really, this is what has to happen. Um, you know, we pride ourselves. I've said this over and over. We pride ourselves at being the only species on the planet that has developed individual self-awareness. We are aware of death. We are aware we can look at ourselves in the mirror you know, ooh, great, you know, aren't we great? Um, But we're completely blind when it comes to coordination. 
And, um, you know, this is where I really align with Greg when, you know, he, he emphasizes over and over again, this is a coordination problem. So any kind of a situation where you have uh, one person or one entity at one end of the planet communicating with another entity at another end of the planet and coordinating, I'm all for it. So, so you know, the idea of net zero is a flawed idea. The ability for people to coordinate with each other is an important thing. So, um, you know, that's kind of my feelings about the whole net zero thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it's, you know, yeah, the net zero thing is obviously in practice totally uh, inadequate and gives cover to all the people that make all the worst decisions. However, I agree with you. It is a glimmer of hope and you have to start somewhere. So I think that even though this solution is not going to go far enough and I look forward to the subsequent solutions over the next few years um, and decades and so forth, um, yeah, I agree with you that it does hold some hope because at least people are thinking about what can we do, you know, to regenerate what we are destroying. Yeah, so and, and how, how we can coordinate cross, across borders and how we can right. coordinate across cultures. Right. And also, I, I like this idea of what is what can I give that someone else cannot give? Like, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of these like groups. I forget what they're called. But this is the groups and people sit down and then everybody says the one thing that they really want in life or something they're struggling with that they really desire. And you just see how many people in that room can do it for you. Like, for example, like somebody would say, my dream is to go live on a ranch for a month and just, you know, ride horses. And somebody in the room will say, oh, I have a ranch. Come over for a month. Yeah, good. And then like that's that person's dream fulfilled, you know, just by someone else in the room who has that to give. You know what I mean? So I think it's like also that sort of exploration of, not everybody can supply everyone with everything that they need. Right. But there, everybody has something to give to society. Everybody has something that can contribute to society. So anyway, just a tangent there. <laughs> it, uh, I, I was going to weigh in real quick that <clears throat> I really feel like the net zero thing gives people license to be irresponsible. Um, you know, there are so many people who go, oh, well, I'll just buy a carbon offset. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that I think is just, just, you know, a recipe for disaster. Yeah. You know, I'm going to make this somebody else's problem. <laughs> yeah. It's just a license to continue to create more of the problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a license to not take responsibility as well, I think. And yeah. not only to pass the responsibility onto someone else, but to perfect, to pretend that somebody else taking responsibility is actually, because it's not just saying, oh, um, okay, we're, we have to do this horrible thing over here. So maybe you can solve it over there. It doesn't even solve it over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't, we, I'm not sure that there's an infrastructure that's actually, you know, checking the accounting that everything is balancing out, right? You know? Where, where's the eye in the sky that's going, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, all why, that's why you see so many blockchain projects trying to do this exactly. now. Yeah. But that still doesn't solve it, right? Because not only are they, well, I don't know, it's almost pointless to get into, but right, you, yeah, you have to account for it. But even if you do account for it, I think the result of that would be to say, well, the emissions still went up and the tree that you planted today isn't going to store carbon for like a hundred years. And even if it did store carbon, it wouldn't even store a fraction of what they just burned. So it's like almost pointless. Yep. So I, I hope I didn't, didn't destroy your segue, Daryl, but I just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't even know if the segue was going to work that good anyway. <laughs> um. But yeah, so so last uh, Monday, Monday afternoon, I was in the middle of a Zoom call when I heard some strange sounds coming from outside, um, rushing winds and water splattering kind of sounds. 
And after the call, I went outside to see what was going on. And I saw a big heavy mirror that was propped up against a wall in our porch, uh, smashed on the ground and other debris scattered on the yard. Um, so this storm, we, I also heard thunder and lightning and it blew by pretty fast. Um, but then about an hour or so later, our daughter gets uh, off from school and she texts me right away. And she says um, her friend's parents, um, so her friend's parents are police, police officers. And, uh, and so her friend immediately informed her that um, all the major routes through the coastal mountain range between our city and Vancouver were washed out cutting off all road access between Vancouver and the rest of the country. Um, um, uh, I'd say, you know, I don't know, a, a vast majority, let's say, of our groceries come through Vancouver in, for Kelowna. Um, so, you know, we participated in the panic and we headed to the grocery store and uh, stood in line. And uh, already most of the produce was already snatched up. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was, you know, another one of those kind of apocalyptic kind of scenes where, um, uh, you know, the stores are, are running empty. Um, but this is where I was going to try to use the segue of people working together. Um, I found that uh, it was a, a, a spirit of um, positivity amongst the people there. Um, uh, there were more than one occasion where there was, you know, one last item and the people debated with each other about who could be nicer by giving it off to the next person. So Canadian. And so, you know, and people were very, you know, civil and, 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 you know, positive with each other, with each other. Then, um, um, so then, you know, I, I kind of, uh, the news started coming out, you know, it was just like anything that happens suddenly, you know, you're kind of in shock. So, you know, we come home that evening, we watch the evening news and we, you know, we see all the kind of footage of uh, bridges completely destroyed, uh, highways completely washed out. Um, uh, uh, the, the city, the entire city of Merritt having to be evacuated. Um, another city of Abbotsford, almost half underwater, where most of the dairy cows are. It's like a major dairy region. Um, and, uh, and then, but we also hear stories about, you know, this, this one guy, who's like, you know, crying for, for gratitude. His, his tears were not of, his, his tears were of being grateful um, because 300 people had all banded together and sandbagged uh, to help save his cows. Um, so there's all these kind of positive stories, you know, the whole kind of idea that the world will descend to Mad Max it hasn't borne true in, in my life so far. It's going to be Mad Max down here, but up there, it's <laughs> going to be cooperative capital. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I, I'd like to think that this is more universal. I think that... I hope. Um, I hope. Yeah. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so it's pretty crazy. Like, uh, you know, you look up the Wikipedia entry of the Pacific Northwest floods um, and uh, it's uh, pretty pretty um you know it was record breaking um and uh and and quite quite devastating and and apocalyptic um the the canadian military just arrived this morning and they're going to be building a levee in in abbotsford um 18, people are still stranded right now uh so there's also stories you're hearing about you know strangers welcoming um people into their homes and uh, but, you know, I was wondering, I was wondering, you know, how and when the kind of news would spread. It's just so interesting kind of being just on the outskirts of something where it's local. And so you're like, okay, how, how's, is the world, has the world learned about this yet? I'm only seeing it on the Canadian news. And then, you know, not long after I started noticing articles in the Guardian and elsewhere. Well, I um, still haven't seen it in the mainstream news, actually. Um, oh, really? No, I saw it um, on Vox, which is not mainstream at all, but I saw it because I follow groups like Zero Hour, Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future. I also follow Guardian Environment. Um, I follow George Monbiot. I follow, um, you know, probably about 50 different climate activists who often post and tweet about this stuff with sources. Um, and then there's a bunch of just like independent climate journalism um, you know, like, um, 
oh, I have to think of some, or but there's a bunch of other sort of, you know, more seasoned scientists like Bill McKibben. And anyway, if people want to know what's going on with climate around the world, you have to follow those types of journalists and groups and people um, because I still have not seen it on any of the major news sources in America, sadly. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. I noticed that there is some articles in New York Times about it, but it's true. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah like the, it the should articles be talked that about, I... you know, it should be talked about. It should be known. Yeah. I'm just actually wondering how has it, has it hit into Washington state at all, uh, Greg? I, I heard that, that, um, that, um, uh, what was it? Bellingham, I think, might have been affected. I haven't heard anything uh, from my daughter, who's uh, going to college up in Bellingham. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, but maybe she's just hunkered down and not talking about it. <clears throat> yeah, I've been I've been kind of um, distant from the <laughs> news lately because I've been working so hard on our chain stuff. So I haven't. I might not. Have, I might have just missed it because of that. But uh, the thing that really, st- the thought that really strikes me about this is that, you know, there isn't going to be anywhere to relocate to, you know, or, you know, you, you think, well, okay, all the, all the folks in the tropical zone, which will, you know, that, that, that won't be home to them. So they can just move North, but no, they can't because <laughs> the floods and uh, the other uh, climate change uh, consequences will be in the north as well, and quite well, likely yeah, will and be even in the south, right? <laughs> even if they're not, you still have an issue of space, right? Oh yeah, of course, of course. But I'm just saying that it's like, you know, there isn't going to be a place that's safe <laughs> to 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 relocate to, uh, assuming that everyone would just welcome you with open arms. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Like the the headline in um, Euronews says British Columbia at the epicenter of climate change fueled weather extremes because, you know, of course, we had that massive heat wave in the summer um, and now just uh, 400 days. No, not not 400. 100 days later. Yeah. um, You know, stream example was that 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 town Lytton BC that I, I remember talking about a few months ago on this call yeah. that you know burnt burnt up the town and now yeah. it's actually part of the uh, flooding so that very same town has gone through both extremes in just a f- you know a couple hundred days or less yeah and I've heard the repairs to the highways are going to be quite difficult because it's the winter now so it's much more difficult to repair that stuff in the winter. Isn't that true? Uh, yeah. So the, the main highway that connects Vancouver to the rest of the country um, will not be repaired for months. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so there's, you know, serious concerns about supply chain. Um, you know, we might, we might have to lean on our neighbors to the South to get, get through. So I guess some people who came who came for a short visit are going to be there for quite some time unless they have access to a helicopter. So there are there is another highway. So the main main highway is gone. There's another highway. It's also gone. But yeah, but they but they say that that second highway, they might be able to open up one lane um, through the devastated area um, in a, a, a week or two. Okay, but um, that'll be that'll be totally jammed for a long time, though. Oh yeah, oh, and yeah, if, gonna if it's it, one it, lane, that's going to be, and, and that's the only way in and out. Yeah, that's horrible. Yeah, talk that's about it. supply chain. This is something I think is so funny. Is like people are always talking about COVID and supply chain stuff, and I'm like, do you guys realize that climate can disrupt the supply chain? Like, do people not get that? Because like I just don't understand like. What happens when the ports are getting inundated with hurricanes all the time? Like, for example, that's like something I think about when I lay awake at night contemplating my existence. I'm like, what if the ports cannot reliably receive and send stuff because it's too violent, you know, at sea? Like, for example, one of air travel is impossible. Air travel is impossible because it's too violent in the air. Well, sure. There, yeah, there you go. 
Or, yeah, here's another thing is like the roads get completely destroyed. You know, why don't we have a huge truckers association for climate resilience? You know, if I made my living driving a truck, isn't that like the number one job in America or something? Or like, a, yeah, it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge percentage of, of uh, the labor force is, is employed in logistics. Yeah. yeah. Like, why isn't there a huge movement for those people just like there was, you know, with. I think they're too busy fending off the robots. Ugh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm getting dramatic now. It's not even 10 a.m. here. This is good. Um, yay. Um, yeah, but you know, I just one other thing I wanted to say was last night I was just putting together, as you know, Greg, I've been deep in the psychological trenches of trying to negotiate with the devil about the prospects for my future. And I <laughs> I was um, the only way to describe it truly. And I was just making some notes about how to be um, more resilient or at least to limit one's exposure to the climate crisis, not only financially, but sort of socially and emotionally as well. And so I made a list of <laughs> I mean, a list of things that I thought one person might do if they are entering life, you know, trying to, or just going through life, trying to prepare for all this. So I might turn that into a blog in the future. That's interesting. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I still think it's all about your relationships. It's all about your relationships. But that's, but that's on there. That's on the list though. It's limiting your exposure in every potential way. So that's definitely on there to make connections. I think it's important. I wrote to make connections with people who are close by and who are far away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to have people that you can rely on that are, you know, a 10 minute drive away and maybe someone on the other side of the country, perhaps, <laughs> or the world even. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, keeping your passport up to date. That's another thing for example. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Well, this That's connects wrong. back to uh, our chain and, um, you know, what we're doing because, um, um, you know, keeping your passport up to date, um, if we can, if we can put that on the blockchain, then, um, you know, perhaps that's a solution. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. <laughs> Uh, I, um, it is a big race, that's for sure. Um, because, you know, we're seeing the, the acceleration of the calamities. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I hope that we can roll out um, a scalable infrastructure in time. Yeah. Well, it's better to try than not try. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, and, and the, the, the race is good and satisfying, but it is absolutely mm -hmm. a race, you know. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I wanted to, um, I don't want to cut anyone else off, but I just forgot that there were two tweets that I wanted to share about this as well. Yeah, what are they? Um, well, I always recommend everyone follow George Monbiot on Twitter. He's got about 450,000 followers. And he's just such an amazing communicator about climate and about nature and just an amazing person that puts out content all the time. Um, and uh, there's two tweets that he put out three days ago in regard to this situation in Canada, but also just the general state of where we are. And Greg, what you just said reminded me of this. First one he said was, for years, journalists and lobbyists told us that we can adapt to climate change but even in one of the richest nations on earth with just 1.2 degrees Celsius of heating, the damage to people's lives is intolerable. And I think that is such an important point is that it's already not working, you know? Um, and the second tweet that he put out said, I'm told by a friend at the epicenter of the latest crisis in Canada that the terrible floods and landslides are aggravated by the fires this past summer which burnt much of the forest and baked the soil. So now water flashes straight off 
It's a classic compound climate disaster. And that's just another thing I think that is not known by a lot of people in the general public is how these different events fit together to accelerate and complicate things. So I just recommend everybody follow him because he always is sharing really important information and that's why his account is growing so fast. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I wonder if there's, you know, other things that we can do to begin to foster this. Um, well, the, you know, the, the sort of spirit that, that Daryl was talking about of, you know, like, the, I wonder if there are ways to have that spirit of coming together before the calamities. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I wonder if there's a way to practice this spirit of, of coming together uh, and helping one another out, um, uh, you know, w without having to have it, you know, um, uh, spurred or, or you know, um, prodded or prompted by by a disaster. But uh, I'm just I, I was wondering if there are practices that we can we can adopt that uh, you know help us come together with without having to have this environmental prompt. And I was, I was re um, recounting how my eldest daughter has had a practice of, of uh, pretending that no matter where she is, you know, if, even if it's a, you know, sort of a routine day, um, that she's on vacation. Um, and so she's just visiting this place for the first time and looking at it with the eyes of, you know, how when you land in a new, in a new town or a new country or something you look at it differently you feel different about it and so she would adopt that that practice on a regular basis you know being on the bus or uh you know going to the supermarket um this practice of looking at it as if ah you know this is my vacation this is where i i came to be to get you know a fresh perspective and i i wonder if there are similar kinds of practices that we can adopt uh to come together <laughs> yeah it's that sense of like childlike wonder and excitement over everything it's like everything's amazing <laughs> yeah 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 but but you know i think when uh you know when we come together it's a it's a slightly different uh, mindset i mean it might be beginner mindset but it's mostly you know just beginning to remember that that we we share more than than we, we have more in common and we have more to offer each other <laughs> than uh, than to be annoyed with each other about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and that might be a wonderful place to end. Thank you both for a great conversation and looking forward to seeing what we talk about next. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to our chain on YouTube and following our chain on Twitter. I think the co-op is about to reach 20,000 followers, which is very exciting. Um, awesome. So that's about double of where the co-op was, I think one year ago. So it's very exciting times. So thank you all so much for a great conversation. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Yep. Thank you, everyone.